And that was a famous moment of, of, of postmodernism. The language of postmodern architecture starts with this image. So the critique set in in the 60s that this is very sterile, this is too simplistic. It delivered enormous prosperity to some extent. Uh, if you look at 1960 in Germany, I mean, 60 million people, everybody, fl electricity, water, conflicts on the table, washing machine, one or two TV channels, packaged holiday, a car, medical. It's all mass mechanical reproduction, but it was incredibly, and this means this consumption standard was achieved in 1960 for literally everyone switching on the light, switching on the TV, taking a car, taking a flight. You can say in many ways uh, 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 the standard of living of every single one of them was, was, was heightened above anybody of the nobility of, of, of 300 years earlier. But then this is limitation. We don't want, and that means you, for everybody to be kind of nine to five, going to, for, for decades, for the whole lifetime, going to the assembly line, going to this insurance kind of uh, bureaucracy assembly line. We want much more than this. And we also don't want, we want only one channel, we want hundreds of channels, and we want YouTube, and we want Facebook, and we want many, many other. And we, want to, uh, uh, we don't want only that packaged holiday once a year. And we have lifelong learning and so on. The city starts to be looking very, very differently. That's already starting in the 60s. Uh, Christopher Alexander saying, hey, we, we're not like this. We're having overlapping, intersecting uh, uh, social circles. We have, we have uh, mixity and, 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 and dynamism in this. So we need to move from this kind of... He thought uh, the modern open society uh, needs to look like this, and we, we have kind of overlap, interpenetration, complexity of networking, not this kind of simplistic uh, order of the simple uh, division of labor of a of the modernist condition, then we have models like this, the Liebeskin kind of taking this on, uh, uh, deconstructivism, and then this is early 90s, uh, our project at Columbia University, we have this kind of strong layering, but each layer is now as well kind of dynamized through squeezing, stretching, gradients are embedded in this. You can see the kind of proto parameterism emerging here in a very, very different sense of intensity later on parametric urbanism. It's kind of continuously morphing, layering, multiple systems interpenetrating and varying at the same time. Um, and this means we're moving from this condition to this condition. And what is interesting here is that each of these cars could be different, but also there's no people anymore. Where are they? They're all kind of pulled together in the city. That's why you have this move and reactivation in the metropolis. And what are they doing? They're just communicating, communicating, communicating. They're reprogramming these robots. And uh, so parametricism is, I showed postmodernism, deconstructivism develops those themes, and deconstructivism has this huge problem of, you can do that, you can layer, you can crash things to each other, you can collage things, and very, very soon you get a sense of white noise sameness, a collapse of legibility in the order. They might be intricate, but they kind of become Chaotic, and so this was never a generalizable um, a paradigm, and it also disappeared after ten years. And so did postmodernism. And what I thought when uh, when I looked back, this was in the in, I started 2007, 2008 to talk about this. This is the article of 2009. I realized, hey, this was going on at that stage since the early 90s. So we were in, uh, 15 years in, and it hadn't kind of been superseded. And we were building the repertory, building the new tools, we're building, and, and we get complexity, intricacy with much more legibility and order. And we get more, more, more success with these kind of projects. They also accept that more. And so I was thinking at that point, it needs, this is something bigger going on than just another of these, what they're now in retrospect called transitional episodes or transitional styles like postmodernism and deconstructivism. Deconstructivism was you know, relatively short-lived. And postmodernism had disappeared by that time as well. But we kept going, and we're now another 10 years in, and we're still, we're still going forward. So Marx was right. Uh, technology is a driver. Post-Fordism to post-Fordism is history's active aspect. The new era, and that's not only architecture, that's 
the new era generally is the convergence of computation and telecommunication. Delivers a technology-induced socio-economic restructuring with momentous lifestyle implications, a new society in all respects. Also much more globalized, much more um, um, dynamized. Um, I call it the post-fordist network society. So post-fordism post is, is a critical discourse I've appropriated, uh, which is coming out of Marxist uh, tradition and evolved um, starting actually with the, with the French regulation school with Aglietta and then moved into, comes out of a Gramscian tra trajectory. It really became very prominent in the, in the 80s, late 80s in, in Britain and throughout the 90s, the post-fordism discourse. And actually the postmodern condition David Harvey was, was tying into this. This was very much in, in, in the consciousness, uh, in particular in urban geography and urban development. Uh, postmodern geographies is actually a post uh, condition as well. So. And this is <laughs> where we're moving from this kind of industrial era to the um, information age, post this network society, uh, which has kind of Moving also from this as the residential part versus the factory part, remember these segments which Le Corbusier plotted out, we're moving into this condition, which is of course London. And I think the components of this should more look like that. This is our Beijing uh, Galaxy project, where you have mixed use and you use the full three dimensionality to, to bring kind of simultaneity and three-dimensional unfolding of man, many and multiple and myriads of, of, of offerings. This is actually a complex where there's hundreds and hundreds of, of smaller companies, our zone included, lots of restaurants and cafes and galleries and, and bars and shops in this. And there should be residences as well. But then, there, there, then we have planning constraints which, which often prevent what uh, really should be happening would, would we degrees of freedom be expanded for everybody to, to find the synergy textures? Uh, planning is making crude what would otherwise, we're still in a kind of semi-modernist planning condition. So this is what I'm propositioning. In, instead of the industrial city, we must build the urban super brain for the knowledge society with R&D, finance, marketing, continuously reprogram the robotic factories. So relations of production are the driver of all social relations. So we need to look first of how are we actually generating these prosperity potentials, the productivity gains, what do they require from us, and we're mostly willing to give it if we're really boosting our productivity, which is ultimately degrees of freedom, freedom, free time, and, uh, and material uh, potency. So. I've always looked at, and that was comes out of Marxist kind of lineage of, of thinking at sites of production, and particular at the workplace, which is now research, development, etc., service sector work, corporate work, often, but also classes of smaller firms. Uh, uh, we're moving from this condition, which is, and it's significant. It's, this is exactly the principles of modernism, where you have you segment special. You separate, specialize, and repeat. In these kind of departmental hierarchies, you have these kind of three, four departments, very different, and each of them have this doing the same, beavering away. And that's the way the, the corporate headquarters also look like, modernist architecture. You move from this to this kind of dynamic ecosystem. The so-called network organization, the assemb <coughs> assemblages of, of interpenetrating uh, 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 collaboration networks. Every project we're doing is always a cluster of multiple firms coming together. Et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is a very, very different. And we've always looked, so this is the modernist, separating the department, very little connection necessary, just a central point, and then you repeat internally. We already had intuitions about interpenetrating and, and having something more fluid. So we, we, we did this at DRL Design Research Lab in London where we looked at corporate headquarters and, and much more open, fluid, dynamic um, conditions. Uh, for, for the workplace. And I think the workplace is a very fascinating um, topic because we're not having so much parallel and separated lives like in the traffic on residential. We have integrated lives. That's where it happens. That's where you connect up. 
in the kind of industrial hubs, in the corporate headquarters, in the campuses, in the Google campuses, etc. So that's my fa one of my favorite topics because that's where architectures put the work most effectively and where the morphologies which come out here, I think these are the winning morphologies. So now I'm saying sometimes Google campus would be the kind of signal client if you convince, if you have the recipes which makes a super prosperity engine of Google even more prosperous and effective, gifting to billions uh, and empowering, it's empowering products. That's where, where architecture would, that would be the litmus test for an architecture. So we have some of those projects. We have this big technology center in Russia. You can see this kind of open um, field conditions we're trying to create. Uh, cross sections, etc. Not this kind of segmented, repetitive, disorienting three or four conditions. And we've been working on this for quite a while and they, to dynamize this because in these organizations, in these production machines, intellectual production machines, people usually don't sit on the same place for, for, from nine to five. They're kind of roaming around and, and need to find each other. And there's a lot of browsing and informal interaction and encounter potentials. So we looked at some of these uh, projects for many, for many years, in fact. So there's, there's a stability. This is still relevant. This is maybe 15 years in. Uh, we're still having this restructuring, intensifying. That network organization more and more substituting uh, uh, big Fordist style bureaucracies, which are uh, this transformation process still going on. We're still moving in the same direction. And so we've been illustrating this and playing with this in, at, at DOL a number of years. And now I have a research project where I'm getting a bit more serious about this uh, with a series of tools simulating interaction processes and, and trying to then also measure up these models and, f and, and understand the efficiency of one constellation versus another with respect to these kind of hubs or hooks and, and uh, a differentiated crowd and various constellations to, to test out and measure out these. And um, to get a handle on what it's all about so we can start knowing what we're doing and overcome that agnosticism because if you look at a plan and I mean this is simple things but if Google asks you to put a thousand people into a big room which we were asked to do uh, by what by what measure do you distribute 50 meeting rooms or are you doing making a hundred small ones or you make a kind of sequence from large to large small to medium you cluster them you, you scatter them where do you place entrances we absolutely have no clue unless we start simulating what these, what these means and empowering and preventing people continuously missing each other. And why, do peop why would Google bring 1,000 people into one space? Only to garner these synergies, to have these cooperative potentials emerge, this information exchange happening. Otherwise, they could, they could, they could work from home. So simulating fun social functionality via agent-based life process modeling, that's the research project here. So and we do this also for our own company and we're in particular looking at the, the most fluid spaces. This is kind of a social uh, networking space in our London, one of our London office. And uh, we want to, we put up sensors as well to measure what happens empirically and we're trying to start simulating the conditions and see with, and we're shifting around the the intervention variables are the architectural variables. Which type of furniture, how clustered, which entrances, which arrangements, which differentiations to offer more variety or more neutrality, relatively speaking. And the, the crowds are, of course we have crowd modeling in, in transport, which is just throughput, bottlenecks, physical engineering kind of crowds. Here it's semiological crowds. We have different characters, different personas, status groups, types, which have different roles and, and, and action protocols shifting also their behavior when they cross a threshold or encounter one type of table versus another. Oh, yeah. That's just the beginning. That's still a research project. That's not a, a, a refined and ready to deliver um, um, service offering yet. So we're doing this both on, the, on that level of the abstract top view um, clustering, which is fast, but we also want to do it in, the, in a way where we can have an intuitive control with respect to the plausibility of the interaction process. 
and it's just the beginning of it. But these these kind of systems could then also be looped into an evolutionary process and be self-optimizing according to a set of criteria you want to set for this. <clears throat> and we can discuss later whether this is positivism or <laughs> or, or or an emancipatory project. Um, and so, this, of course, it's demanding. There's a lot of uh, intelligence required for the designer to build this up, uh, to develop these protocols, to develop these decision trees and behavioral trees of these actors, and 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 experiment, and then look out for global pattern and for success criteria to validate one of the other. And this will take place. And that's another important thing for me, not in a kind of modernist, minimalist grid. It, 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 it will take place in a parametricist, much more complex and varied, full of gradients and interaction and overlap conditions. And the, 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 the anticipation here is not only that for particular projects we can tease out how to distribute the various places and spaces, but we bring a whole new repertoire, a categorical new type of concept, for instance, gradients and overlap and multiple rather angle and orthogonality and can demonstrate the superiority uh, and, and efficiency gains of parametricism as stylistic repertoire of solving this, a larger, more subtle and more versatile toolbox delivering more, much more refined and, and empowered settings than a minimalist would have, that an information enriched, more articulate, more, more, with more graphic information embodiment setting is more empowering and more efficient than a kind of neutral gray condition. So we will in the end be uh, selling these not only on a sense, an intuitive sense, hey, I love this space. Why are we loving it? Because we sense that it's empowering, that it's lively, that it's enriching, that it's, that it's kind of um, uh, informing so that we aligning and this validating these intuitions with, 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 with evidence-based simulations, if you like. So I just wanted to go through. Uh, now, so this is the setup. This is the kind of um, categorical setup, life process modeling, the semiological project, ordering social processes. That would be a new setup, no matter which style we would want to design. This is, some, um, this is anybody would have to buy into. That becomes compelling for everybody. Now the question is on which style should we deliver these architectures, which we then elaborate, uh, um, adapt intricately, and measure with these. And you can say adapt intricately. You can see already the parameters would be more, more versatile. We get more degrees of freedom to tease out the optimal configuration, whereas, whereas the minimum was could only shift a wall this way. We could do the wall image much more subtly adapt, so we, we have much more optimization potential. Nevertheless, that we all have technological advantages. So, so I'm just going through parametrism a little bit, that world to this world, and that these things are simply not complex enough. We had to negate, so since we have to um, um, throw out and have a negative heuristic, what we no longer do, we're no longer falling back to these modes, these default conditions. That lack of variety is, is no longer acceptable. That's kind of, and we really have to realize that you have to stop this because this is just false. This is so crude. Why, if you, you know, if you do 100 the same, you, you're certain that 99% of what you're doing is wrong. Um, these are no longer up for grass. It's not my opinion. I like them. This, this becomes compelling. If we had an open and frank discourse where we could kind of probe each other, these, we, these are becoming. And also, I think this is the, the, the difficult, another one. So we, this repetition is not many, not many few people buy into it, except for Chipperfield. <laughs> uh, but now what we're having instead, we have this kind of agglomeration of pure difference. Yes, that's better than this. But there's huge problems with this too. So I'm saying, hey, I'm moving forward. We right, reached here, collage city. But that lack of order is disempowering because you can't orient within it. You need GPS, and that, kind of, that is then you're staring at your screen instead of browsing the, the urban environment. So that has to stop. 
So where are we going if we're stopping everything which was happening for 5,000 years, symmetry, proportion, repetition, but also the agglomeration, the collage which happened since? We need to, well, I said we, we look at nature and we look at the complex variegate order there, which is very much what parametricism is. Where do we draw all our tools and anal analogies from? You know, the compu from computer graphics, from science simulations, from, from visualizations of hair, smoke, uh, elasticity, gradients. Are we looking at these kind of systems? They have intricacy, differentiation, adapti adaptiveness, but also they have a sense of order, legibility, and, and tractability, and navigability. So you get a lot of variety, and yet you have structure, order. And so positive, we have all the elements which you're working as are parametrically malleable. So they, be, they can adapt, they can make themselves adapt to contingent conditions, complex sites. Uh, the new constellations they always have to be part of uh, in each new situation, novelty and complexity in every project. So that's a given. But also we can embed constraints and intelligences. We can have technical intelligences embedded. And we still have a huge search space um, to deliver. And that's about the potency of algorithms that we can handle and, and solve very complex configurational issues, um, which we simply couldn't handle. So there's, there's, there's the kind of empowerment coming in. Um, differentiation is very important. So instead of repetition, we have differentiation, we have variation across. So instead of one element always the same, there is a range, and the larger the range, the better. So you can always improve in parametrism. You can make the degrees of freedom larger. You can have the range of variation across which an element is, is moved larger. So there's always a heuristic of making a better project, a more sophisticated project. You can make that, the varia that variation more expressed, more subtle, more nuanced. And um, you can again bet technological intelligence in it. You can have, you can make, you can transcode sun exposure map in, in uh, shading elements, and they they would differentiate across, so that you be more efficient at each point in terms of energy and more efficiency materially. And um, you can see in retrospect, modernism is always overdimensioning and underperforming, uh, because it has to choose one element and then ignore all the varied, the, the, the varied performance conditions. And the interesting thing is that once you develop the environment list, it kind of becomes legible because you can see where the intensity of sun is. The sun directions are being embedded now visually in the facade. The building opposite imprints its shadows, becomes re resonates, and becomes information rich. So the interesting thing is that these technical means of optimization become at the same time automatically. It's a serendipitous add-on legibility enhancers and information enriching um, conditions. And the thing is, we need to look at parametricism as a style which has an ideological push, which has an agenda, which isn't just solving technical problems. And there's also an aesthetic drive, which I can finally is instru becomes instrumental, that for instance, this is a parametric model, this is, the, this is the, the way Foster uses parametric tools in the service of making this as neutral and homogeneous as possible. Whereas we're saying we would like the conspicuous amplification of difference because this kind of space you can gather a big, massive, modernist crowd. This kind of space you can differentiate the various and, and self-differentiating, self-sorting multiple multitudes, as it were, under such a roof. And then you can see the kind of uh, um, uh, much more intricacy and, 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 and variation across uh, this. And it's still not a chaotic condition. Um, so the differentiation operates on all levels, on the level of facade elements, furniture elements, or urban uh, blocks or components. And you can imagine here they're just on a neutral uh, they're kind of creating a trajectory, and they could also respond to topography, to a road, to a river, this kind of adaptive condition. And I think this is very important that this differentiation is correlating to something else, that we have always multiple systems 
not single system projects, which at the beginning of parametrism we had. We have multiple systems and, they, and their differentiation uh, correlated and, they, and they, 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 it, it leads to a point or leads to another system. So you always have multiple system correlating dependency relations. That's the whole point of parametric associative logics, that you have dependency chains. Every action has a reaction. And that means when, the, when, when, when you embed that reaction, you can actually perceive the action without, you know, make visible the action and make visible the, the sub subsystems behind, the drivers. A kind of fabric differentiation can actually reveal topography or reveal channels pouring in, etc. It becomes highly ordering. So every action is a reaction. The tower lands, not nothing happens, something must happen. It kind of creates a space, a ripple effect, and you can, and one becomes resonant, resonant, resonating with the other. And that becomes the principles uh, which I recommend. And once they adhere to, it become very, very empowering. Every major event could radiate through the whole city and announce itself everywhere. And the multiple subsystems um, um, layer on top of each other, and I won't explain this into detail, but there's a series of r rigorous kind of adaptations of one system to another and they all correlate, and you get something very, very organic and intricate, and somehow we perceive it as beautiful, because we respect and have, um, yeah, a sense of awe in front of something which is so intricately organized. And that's, you don't want to mess around. But there's a deconstructivist composition, which is just kind of rambling things together. It's just garbage anyway. You can, you can hammer it, you can push, you can throw things at it. Has, you don't, you're not destroying anything. You can see that there's a lack of intricacy there. And therefore, a lack of respect and a lack of curiosity because nothing means anything. But in these cases, everything means something and there's a kind of intricate networking of everything with everything else, which makes it very subtle, very awe-inspiring, very beautiful, and rightly so because these things we should uh, be, pay attention to because the one thing leads to another. And I think that's why our aesthetic sensibilities are intuitively geared towards there's one universal aspect of beauty, which is the sense of order versus chaos. And you can look at a symphony of subsystems um, 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 generating a kind of elegant and beautifully and intricate environment. Now, so these are the principles, and I wanted to canonize parametrism by making it very kind of, you could maybe come up with five or, or six or two, but I thought this is a good way to bring them out. Negative, very important, stop doing this. And positive, always do this. But you can always do more. Make them softer, more malleable. It's the better version. Differentiate, more nuanced, varied. Correlate, you can always do more. That system correlates to another system. Maybe correlate also to something further away. Maybe something underground, something. So there, these are infinite projects. And the more you do this, the more you work on it, the more beautiful, the more sophisticated, the more, the more kind of potent, effective it will become. So we have a heuristic, I call it a heuristic principle, a set of principles, which are abstract in general. You can do it in a hundred and creative ways. And par the parametrism is a style which offers to a creativity a kind of universe of, of exploration and creative invention, which is much richer than all the previous styles put together. And yet, there's a relatively clear thing how you have a design evolved at some point, you can always do more. That makes it very potent rather than kind of... And, and because there is this thing of the intensification of relations as, as the key game, and that fits to society where everything connects to everything else where we have to calibrate what we're doing and recalibrate with everything what else is doing because we're all kind of networked and moving and coordinated movement together in a dynamism. And you can't be, allow yourself to, to isolate yourself and pull away and sit in a province and think you know what you're working on and a year later you realize that all you're working on was for nothing because you haven't watched out what everybody else is doing. You're not tying in. You're actually working on something which has already been achieved or you're working on something which, 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 which is kind of... You, <clears throat> which is kind of yesterday's uh, network. And that's why the style concept is, yes, it is interested in formal repertoires, principles, and they become 
dogmatic in a sense that you compelling. And they are sort of dogmas and taboos, so you can think it's quite rigid. But at the same time, but these are meaningful, compelling, because they tie in with formal heuristics. A style isn't only about a formal repertoire. It is also about a certain sense understanding of the purposes and functions, how to interpret and understand functions. The modernists understood their function, the function of architecture, very, very different from the classicists or historicists. They had a whole new kind of conception of a mass society which they which were driving to function and wasn't something available. The way they interpreted and mechanized and measured functions uh, in the 20s was very different from the 19, 1890s. And we have a very different understanding as well. So we also look at functions no longer in terms of fixed stereotypes. We're not presuming social homogenization like the modernists, and we're not doing the segregative zoning. We always look at functions as parametrically variable event scenarios, which in the end isn't a label from a schedule of accommodation, but that agent model. So it's a new way of understanding functions. It's the, the programs domains, they're all differentiated. We don't have kind of the foyer. There's multiple sub-foyers and types of foyers, and we need to characterize, and it's not just one stereotype. And they're not separated. They're all kind of in, intricately intercommunicated, interaware. So we have a very, very different understanding of social function program conceptions in parametricism, the contemporary programs conception. And then you can see if you compare this back, how they are tied in with each other. And that's why I say a more substantive concept of style has both a formal heuristics and the functional heuristics. And that's what it looks like. But for reasons. And that's no longer just, oh, willful and, and playful and artistic and, you know, these things must look like this, and you can recognize it. You can see immediately that this is a kind of an outmoded modernist, crude, where somebody's trying to solve an integrated form, but just, uh, you know, with, with fists basically running in, 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 in orthogonal patterns rather than kind of something. So you see it right away, and that's great, that's good. That we have an aesthetic sense of the good, the subtle, the dynamic, the vital environment, which is this, and the sterile, monotonous, horrible environment, which is modernism, or the kind of chaotic, uh, menacing, garbage spill, identityless kind of white noise, which is current old cities. So we need to navigate the world aesthetically. And we need to, the whole point is also this, the discipline, the leaders of the discipline also cre uh, propose and engender and succeed with aesthetic revolutions. That's what the modernists did. To some extent, the postmodernism and deconstructors did, and that the parametrism is doing as well. And we need to, it's a culture war within the field as well. It's an also an aesthetic values war. Okay. And I'm now going through a few things, I'm just uh, very quickly in terms of uh, parametrism, the general principles, that they're kind of series of, in retrospect, once they're talking about tectonism, which I'll come to, the latest stage, that there's been a series of stages and steps one of the first ones was foldism, where everything was just a single, single pleated system. There's something great about this, but we've be gone beyond this. But there's lots of projects like this, which, which on all scales, uh, which did, um, and dynamizing as well, which is, used to be called folding, I call it now foldism. And then uh, it's, 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 it's the first stage of uh, um, parametricism. And it's just endless, these kind of projects, and we're still doing them. Uh, kind of one thing bleeds into another, and it's open textures, and instead of plugging things together like in a collage, this kind of, it, it becomes, it, the potency of this, you can generate complexity with, with easing the eye and not cluttering up the scene. Uh, you get a variation. In, this is just a whole urban, urban fields, complex interiors like this, where you can have balconies and, and lighting gantries and, Etc. cetera, um, 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 brought under the formalism of the pleated folded surface. And you can also dynamize them and, and, and so on. It's a different, instead of having rigid, f segmented uh, floors, etc. And this is what we're doing. Uh, this is all foldism, if you like. And, and, and the important thing is, it's kind of formalism, like with the, with the park and ride scheme. So, so the lighting scheme helps with the staircase. 
to not clutter up with lots of things, but to allow the essential, very complex spatial relations to flow through and guide through and, and make a legibility discourse, a kind of plasticity, conspicuity, legibility discourse. Um, this is all foldism. Instead of cluttering it up, kind of using that one surface to, to, to deliver. It's very potent. The same as with the way these kind of the plazas bleed in. And we're still doing this. This is a recent project uh, which we're just finishing in, in China. Um, so, <laughs> foldism is, uh, is now kind of 20 years old. We're still kind of delivering projects, but we're onto something else. So, in a way, what I'm talking about next is the critique of this earlier stage of parametricism. It delivers as much better than minimalism and postmodernism and, and deconstructism, I would guarantee you, or would, would, would argue, um, in terms of its potency, the complexity it maintains, uh, or the, the legibility it maintains in the face of levels of complexity uh, is totally beyond the capacity of a postmodernist or deconstructivist condition, and the complexity itself is totally beyond the capacity of, of minimalism, let's say. So these are the projects. Um, And blobism is nearly another version of it. It came a little bit later. Uh, it's, it's great about it that you don't have you know, either a room A, a room B, building A, B, C, the cluster together, either belong or don't belong. Degrees of fusion, separation, belonging. So you have from logic, set logic to fuzzy logic, for instance. They're very, very potent. And you can also then, once you have these kind of semi-articulated zones and subzones, you can also kind of shift around and, and, and change with them. So this is neither one big vast space undifferentiated, nor is it three, four cells. It's something kind of subtle with degrees of fusion, belonging, separating. And you can also dynamize this. So, so this is blobism. And we've done uh, all sorts of projects on this basis. And, uh, and here, just throwing this in, now we should always bring in the social diagrams, the interactions, to see what this means. What are these strange forms meaning? And the stranger you go, the more inventive you become, can't relying on knowing already what the diagram is, the more you have to show. You have to, otherwise you're just playing with form. And we've been criticized for just playing with form initially. If we do this, we're no longer just playing with form, we're instrumentalizing form, we're solving problems with these forms. And the formalism, the formal research, the formal expansion, the repertoire, the expanded repertoire is an expanded toolbox. So these are all the kind of blob uh, projects we've been doing. I mean, they're, they're kind of striking and potent. But I want the whole city to become something like this, more varied. So now they're temporarily, they pop out like a sort of unique kind of icons. This is not, the, this is not our ambition here. Uh, but they are kind of striking. Um, 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 uh, and you can recognize them, and they become kind of potent and uh, conditions. My dream of a kind of all the towers should be hollow and everything simultaneously interacting and vi intervisible, interaware, uh, interior urbanism to the as 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 as, as something which I'm interested in. We, we're actually doing this one, and uh, so swarmism came along a little bit later. Once you had generative components and you could populate a, a this came originally out of facade design when you had pe people start to make these com these forms and you had to make tessellate them and you kind of craft that. So they build algorithms to kind of tessellate and adapt a, a, an element to all the conditions. And I jumped on this and hey, we can, we can use that and populate landscapes with buildings and became parametric urbanism. So that swarmism thing was in fact that one which you most associate with parametricism. Uh, it came a little bit earlier before I coined the phrase, but, but it's great. It, it's, 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 uh, it's something um, uh, which we were running with and again, it's a little bit single system still, and I'm yearning for multiple system, and it can do it with, 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 in, in all sorts of conditions. And it's, it's also great that with these swarms, you know that you don't have to make contiguous entities to indicate territory zones, f flocks, swarms, they're still entities, they have, they have shape, they have form, and they can, they can interpenetrate, they can kind of uh, also dissolve and peter out, there's a kind of, uh, gradient condition, degrees of object constituting. This is very, very potent and powerful. It's a bit, uh, the move from, as I said, simple sets. The first step was from set theoretical relations, only nesting and separateness. Then there was this shock of innovation where Chumi and Eisman said we can intersect and overlap. Wow. Then we're moving from there to bleeding and open and fuzzy logic. And you can know that fuzzy logic has, is much more powerful in problem solving 
in many, many domains, and I would argue also in, in the architectural domain. And what I found was striking that the real world, outside any architect's ambit, discovered through management theory and through experimentation on the shop floor of bureaus, these kind of swarm formation. There's no architect involved. This is a spontaneous outcrop of necessities. These are high performance offices. I jumped on this, and you can read the, write the retroactive manifesto, kind of Rams phrase, that a lot, a lot of times reality finds things out, whereas the architectural canons and academic kind of values, they have an inertia which is outlasting its usefulness, and you have the kind of reality cropping up new things, which then we need to discover. That's learning from Las Vegas, learning from uh, Delirious New York, and I'm, for me, it's learning from the Bureau Landschaft. You can see the kind of swamp, how you can articulate a zone just by directionality, density, and maybe morphology of the elements. And you could also let these swamps pass by. So then we radicalize that. And then we're saying it's not only tables, it's, it's fields of lights, fields of partitions, fields of everything, swarms of everything. Um, and early on in the DOL, this is already over 10 years old, we're saying, okay, we're bringing in the, the, the interactions, we dynamize this, responsive environments, brought the end agents in, and it became clear that the agents need to stay, that the agents is, is the only, um, it becomes a compelling necessity for an architectural project of a certain level of complexity, not if you, if you, if you, if you draw up your grandmother's let's say, apartment where you know that's a bedroom and the kitchen and the, the living room, there are three people. Yeah, you don't need to have an agent model for that. <clears throat> but even we look, if you have a complex villa and a social event with, where you have, throw a party with, much, with multiple uh, characters of 50 people, you already need that, I think, to make, an, make, make that work. So we're we, we starting to work on morphologies, always with the crowd and differentiation. You can do it like this, you don't have to necessarily dynamize them. Um, swarmism in all ways and fashions to this day. So, final chapter. So we have foldism, blobism, swarmism, parametrism, a series of stages and steps. And what we're working on now, and this is already, I think we're on to this for about 10 years, but very, very little has been constructed at scale. Most of these things are research lodged in universities, in pavilions, and small constructs. Um, so we have, my theory of style has epochal styles and subsidiary styles. So in modernism, you have functionalism, organicism, rationalism, brutalism, metabolism, high tech. They all are modernism because they all tie in with the mechanical age. They all have separation, specializing, repetition in various ways. Then you have transitional styles, postmodern deconstructors, and then you have parametrism, the epochal, and we should expect a series of subsidiary styles to emerge. And there will be more, and there's others, there's the Bartlett with its slightly different uh, way of working, when the new kind of aesthetics coming out, I call it discretism. Since I'm, I'm not 100% proponent of it, I haven't listed it. <laughs> I think tectonism is much more potent than this. And I also would, would distinguish, I would think that some of the triple O work at the sci -arc is a form of parametricism, uh, which I call virtualism, but it is also problematic. So, um, so, and the point is here that these styles are aligned with socioeconomic eras. Okay, final chapter. Tectonism in the context of architectural semiology. So this is what tectonism looks like. And you can see it looks much, quite a bit different you still see its parametricism, it's still kind of this organic world, the endless forms of nature a bit, but it's much more diverse. It's not only the various nerve surface and blobs, which are always splines and blobs in the nerve and subtif surfaces, they're much more particular geometries. For instance, the tensile geometry, which is kind of minimal surfaces and, and, and minimal tension surfaces, or shells of various types. <clears throat> And then fabrication logics come in. There's not, so the morphologies are much more particular, and then the patterning and materiality is much more particular, whereas before we didn't think about that. We just made these forms, they were all nerve systems, and then we made them kind of white plaster or fiberglass. It's something much more articulate, which has to do with fabrication, engineering, environmental engineering logics, imprinting their particular optimization logics, and 
yet we have so many degrees of freedom that we can absorb all these and yet be super adaptive to, to, to conditions. In, in, tower, in tower design, it means mostly articulate skeletons and varied kind of uh, brise conditions. Fray Otto is the only precursor, I would argue. That one can also maybe bring in some of Gaudi's work. So tectonism is the stylistic heightening of engineering and fabrication-based form-finding and optimization processes. So it's a constraint. So it restricts, we're not playing freely with nerve surfaces. I mean, that there are nerves is also a constraint, so we have more types of constraints. But we can kind of pre, we were much more, that we can deliver up to the technological optimization, which isn't our business. But what I like about this, we should always have to uh, uh, um, recognize this. It makes us lightful and efficient. But we also, we return, we get this new kind of expressive, rigorous, expressive vocabulary which becomes a palette for the semiological project. It is the subsidiary style of parametrism, so it's not something new. All the principles I was listing are in place, and now we have additional um, uh, demands. It's a, it's a tougher, it's a much harder, more sophisticated project than the project I've been talking about for. <clears throat> So we always should aim for more, we should hire, we should, be, we should make our life harder, we can achieve more. And tectonics has been always there. I was talking at the beginning, you have this kind of ornamental overlay, which is always a requirement. And where does it come from? You can arbitrarily, you can uh, 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 invent it, but often it became a kind of hooked up onto the morphologies which came out of the material making. So you're weaving something with threads and it becomes the weaving pattern becomes ornamental. Or brick laying or courses and, 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 and cornices or, ed, or, or these kind of arches. There are certain necessities and they become heightened into ornaments. So that's the way it's always been and that's still the way of tectonism. And this becomes a semiology, the rustication <coughs> versus the piano nobile versus the, versus, versus the um, polished uh, uh, private quarters. And you find that in, in the Gothic, you find uh, that there's a kind of ornamental heightening of structural systems. And we've took this up and we make it more potent by varying the ribs. In the Gothic, you see it's always the same, bay, 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 bay. And the outside isn't treated, so we're doing it inside and outside, varied compression and tension, so they kind of a super sophisticated kind of, uh, I don't want to call it neo-Gothic, kind of parametricized learning from the Gothic, the tectonics. It's, a, it's an early tectonism project from DRL. And of course we have uh, Gaudi with geometries, Dieste. So there are some um, precursors. And there's Philip Locke, for instance. And what all of these uh, models show, particularly in Fray Otto, and, uh, is that you have this rigor of the form found geometry, but totally freedom of the plan and not an orthogonal freedom like the modernists, you can fit into any condition, any site, you can always strap a network onto it. And Philip Block is a great researcher we're working with who can do full-on compression vaults on any arbitrary free plan and section and yet optimize it. And it creates a very particular morphology. It, and the beauty of here is this, that you can recognize. We have a character recognition capacity. We can recognize somebody by his or her walk we can recognize what belongs together, all the variants of this, across the variants, there's unity across difference, which is the rigor of this geometry, of this algorithm, of this efficiency, but it also gives me a kind of family resemblance which I can use for the semiological project. And it's interesting that we're then interested in the tessellation which comes out, which, gives, which, which is correlated with where the forces flow and where, the, where, 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 where surfaces are. And I think that's very potent. And we like that, it tells us something. And it's, of course, it's amazing, it's super efficient at the same time. And that's good too, we, 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 we're space efficient and we delight in that sense of lightness because we have, a, we have an inbuilt, our aesthetic sense through which we navigate the world always because we, we cannot go around analyzing everything. We've, we've conditioned to love and find beautiful the high performance. Of course, when Technology conditions change, we have to relearn what the high performance looks like, and then we, get, we start to love it. And so we're working with this. And what is important is to do this, the, the material form finding, 
you can research this, you do this, and in a DOL will be doing all these material models to tease out morphologies, which one can work with and translate and transform into the digital. And uh, that's the world of tectonism, where, we, where we're working with material computation, form-finding methods, ma material optimization, technical optimization, bringing the repertoire. What we love about this is not only that this is more efficient, we actually, as architects, we're not responsible for that, only indirectly. What we love about is the diversity of formal articulations, the richness, the tellingness of the, of the inner texture relative to, and it is harmonizing with the outer morphology and the particular the particularness of it, the unity across difference of these. That's what we really love and do, the, the, tech, the, the expressiveness as a repertoire of articulation. And um, this, I think, is very, very potent. And, and so this huge investment recently in fabrication technologies is the same. Of course, it would be great we can use all these technologies, the robotics, but we also like that they're coming out with a particular look that creased folding, that particular creasing, pleating, folding. And we, we, we like the patterning and the fact that the pattern changes and has to do with, and it's not just a, a, a print, a modernist print on. And even the bolts we love because we articulate seams and openings and so on. So Mark Fawns is an interesting one. Uh, here you have a kind of 2D embedded 3D in the patterning. And look at these pavilions. They're not just NURB surfaces. This is Achim Menges and the, and the Stuttgart. So you have the active bending version, and you have the um, hexagonal, kind of varied hexagonal um, 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 plate or shell version, carbon fiber weaving in, in various different types. And the beauty here is how varied these all are, and, and yet they're all parametricism, and yet they're all, and, and you can get the kind of, you can have a unity across a material and you can have three or four different types of carbon fiber and you get a rich articulated repertoire. Uh, structural ribbing, um, which we use in our uh, Beijing pavilion. So you can have a grid shell which isn't just an imposed modernist grid, but an intricate grid which, which traces primary stress lines and secondary. And you, and you get something much more much more intricate, much more efficient, much more beautiful and telling, and, and, and the lines have to do where the forces come down, and they guide you and, 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 and make you, um, orient you in, in a structure like this. And we do that also for furniture. And it becomes universally applicable, like the modernist principle in the Bauhaus. Tectonism goes across all um, the whole range of scales and design disciplines as well. And this becomes, uh, and of course, there's always artistic decisions, how fine-grained you do this. The shape is also an initial position, then a, and a mesh relaxation. Then you have the, the reticulation out of the topology optimization. And then you decide to do it through thickness plus density of perforation, and you get something which is super light and super robust, potentially, and efficient, and you get, this, you get the high performance and you feel it and sense it, and you will, and you will learn to, to recognize what looks right and feels right. It's high performance, and it's a new aesthetic and a new intricacy. And so we apply that to different types of uh, projects and processes. And uh, so this is whole exhibition we had at our gallery, all the different robotics experiments uh, which imprint their physiognomy and factura quality on the various types. And this world is so much richer than parametrism used to be. Uh, where we just had these kind of fiberglass forms, right? And, and it's a new world, it's the endless forms of nature, there's most of this Bartlett stuff, uh, plus some DRL stuff in this, and we're working also here with Xtri and, and Philip, and so we, we'll, this form isn't an arbitrary form, it recognizes that you can actually print it, so you can't kind of go overboard with the leaning out. So there's certain overall morphology constraints, and of course, there's a tool pass, and we rather have the tool pass, we could add grain, it adds plasticity and character, rather than kind of polishing it out. We, that's the aesthetics we have to learn. And we're actually accepting this and, and, and valuing this because it gives now differentiation and character, expressiveness, which we can use for the semiological project. We're intuitively attracted to this, but we should also use this for the semiological project. And so we do that in all sorts of different ways. And these forms, they're also particular and peculiar. Well, they're to do with the fact that we're not milling anymore the polystyrene forms, so we kind of super fast hot wire cutting, which imposes that ruled surface, and off we go, and all these benches have that sharing that character of the ruled surfaces, and we, and we like it. 
And we like the fact that towers aren't just curtain walls, but they're kind of structures and skeletons of various types that the, for, as they move from bottom to middle to top, they kind of ease out and fade out. And across the difference, they all do the same thing because they all do with gravity in their own kind of expressive way. So they're a better family than the random family we get from the condition of postmodernity, let's say. And we, this is the one we, it's actually on site, the first skeleton. What is beautiful also that the, the skeleton generate different conditions, three apartments, two apartments, one apartment, and you can hook up programs to the differentiation. You can call a program with structure, with height, and it becomes expressive and articulate. And this is a, a recent one with, we just completed. And again, this idea of hollowing out and making intervisible and intercommunicative all the spaces within this. And, and, and um, uh, environmental imprinting, um, not just a black a, a mirror glass box, but, but something which is very different to different orientations as you go around. It represents the, the sky directions, as it were. It's also navigating, navigation as horizontal and vertical and a project which was derived its morphology on environmental parameters. So it's engineering, structural engineering, environmental engineering, fabrication logics, all these kind of engineering project logics, which isn't our project, but we closely work with and take it up, and our task is to turn it into the communicative capacity in a, in a kind of congenial uh, uh, translation of technical morphological differentiation into articulation. And what is beautiful about this, once you have these, again, you have this very different skeletons representing structure and unifying across, we have this opening up to the wind and shielding against the sun, both by solid volumes and by lightweight canopies. So you get kind of unity across different things of different ontology ordered together because they're dr run by the same underlying set of parameters, which unifies across, which makes these things belong together better, rather than patching together the things which are. So here we have we are helped, in a sense, in our compositional project, bringing things under formalism by some of these uh, unifying parameters. And this is kind of a build project, which may, one of the few, I would say, tectonism projects which are on a larger scale built. Um, so the courtyards do something very similar to the, to the canopies um, and the sky, and as well as the atriums. And you can then still differentiate Condition is just saying uh, Beijing Airport for you quickly, um, where we also use structure and, and light to orient out, orient big orient huge orientation space light coming in, and then th these lines pull you out into the into the gates into the arms, and um, differentiation of shells multiple shells they're optimized they're no longer circular or gothic shells, and the thing is, these kind of structural optimization lines, you can then have artistic choices. You articulate them like this, like this, through more contrast, or like this through pleats. They're varying in degrees of efficiency. Efficiency isn't the only and final argument. You can orchestrate them into differentiating social situation using this as a language of articulation. You can put lights into this. You can different characters. It all feels very ornamental, but it's all different of, of by, by, by structural logics. And they're heightened into ornament, which ultimately is instrumental for semiology. So very, very different atmospheres between uh, these various characters. And so, <laughs> Again, aesthetic sensibilities, you sense the performance, but you also have to relearn what performs. Maybe this becomes vulgar and disgusting, and this is elegant and cute and sweet, and we have to move from here to here. So there is, under new conditions always, a relearning. So it's not natural, but we have a sense of learning quickly and navigating the, the world aesthetically. Um, and the same is with these kind of ideals of beauty, they kind of the migraine shift and the same as this, and so we have to, we have to know which choice to make. Um, and if you like this, you're nostalgic. You 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 rotten, hopeless, making yourself dysfunctional. If you like this, go home. You know, forget it. <laughs> but this is this is still folism. So the tectonism version is the next one we have to kind of appreciate. And I want to show you what we did at GSD five years ago. So we have we have all these potentials. Um, it's already a kind of proto-tectonism. These are tectonism projects, actually, because the structural logics 
uh, differentiating hugely uh, these kind of campus projects. So there's project one, project two, very different grid shirts, project three, all catenary based. And they're great, they're doing a lot of differentiating, but when it comes to such a huge thing like Google campus, it's so hard, you collapse back into monotony, even with that kind of tectonism ramp up. And that's why as you move from here, they, these three projects actually should be all in one project and more. And then you get more differentiation, you, you overcome the monotony. So we need to, in, in a sense, bring these projects into bear and more to deliver Google Campus, which is a signal project. Whoever delivers Google Campus is on the right side of history. And what is beautiful here is the semiological project. You see that this, that, that kind of characterization is always both similar to some, with some degree, contrasting with other, belong to this to some extent, belong to this also, belong less to this, contrasting with this. So you can have similitude across here and difference, because similitude across here as well, and difference, and similitude across here as well as difference, and similitude across here. So you have this kind of multiple network of similitude and contrast. That's the way you work, the way you select these and allocate them and orchestrate them. They function, they're semi, uh, functionally equivalent, although it's much more brighter, so you tie it in with the bright spaces where the more light is allowed, but there is this element of orchestrating compositionally, artistically, linguistically, if you like, in terms of lingual language, that's our project. And we're doing it with the repertoire of the most sophisticated, high-powered engineering fabrication artifacts, but our task is this, because in the end, Achim has to hand over the engineering to Knippers, the manufacturing to various expert contractors, and in the end, what he's left with is that project of semiology, once he's moved away from the proto-engineering role and really the mature architect who's, who's delivering that to Google Campus in a team. And this is a metaphor of the kind of ecology of sea species uh, which, which come together in this. Um, so I don't want to uh, tell too much, but we've done the series of these semiological projects where we're trying to give meaning to these pattern differentiations and you can see immediately that, that such a ceiling is more telling than this. Modernism is intentionally incredibly disorienting, like, like kind of grid where you don't know in which line you are and where you are moving, in which direction you're moving. So this is much more of telling. And the other image I want to give you, if you imagine you have this kind of intricately structured, meaning embedded information which built environment, there is no limit to our supercomputer we have up here to learn this language and take it in intuitively, an enormous amount of density of language information, like these guys who can read novels by running their hand over a pattern. So if you imagine if they can do this, we can just close our eyes and with a vestibular sense and take in and read shitloads of information empowering us when we move to build an environment, if it was intricately designed like as text which it should if we take all the noise out and it becomes an articulate project. So there's a kind of quite potent, um, you know, there was a humanity before writing. And there was a humanity before kind of electronic communication. So it's a hugely empowering and soaring humanity project and, and the built environment for positioning is of that caliber and order, something unheard of, unspoken of, never seen, and incredibly potent. If we want to do it, we can. And so you can build it up, and I can't have the time to explain it in detail, and you look at this, and there's all this information there, which you can kind of download as, as the Braille guide reading, or as you take in the kind of strange sound vibration they're throwing at you at a staccato pace. No problem, you take it in. And there was a period in time where kind of primates had no capacity to do this. <clears throat> and so, so we, can, we, can, we can evolve in this, and you can build up the system of distinctions and give meaning to various subsets and build up a grammar which is underlying your capacity to, to, to decode what I'm saying. There's, a, there's an underlying integrate structure there, which linguists are kind of trying for the last 200 years to, 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 to to tease out, and we can build it in, build a grammar into um, different types of shells, mean different things, different type of uh, in, 
interaction situation, take different footprint shapes, you can combine and build complexity, systems of distinction in combinatorics, you can have a huge proliferation of messages and distinctions. You can kind of combine them into larger sentences and utterances in various ways, one dominating, equal with an interim, with a fusion, and you can build up a kind of complex structure which the patterning means something again, and you can use optimization language, all these repertoires, and bring them into an orchestrated grammar, and you articulate that kind of text. And it looks very complex at that point, and you cannot take it in because for you it's like me speaking Chinese to you, but there is an underlying structure, and the Chinese can understand Chinese. And we will learn these languages not by going through dictionaries, but by living and inhabiting an environment that is structured like this, and you pick it up as you go along. And you will be able to navigate these things, and they will all tell you important things. And you can simulate this because I can empower these agents and make them responsive in their action, in their shift to each other. They know where they are and pick up all the signals and I can simulate what it means, and if everybody is walking around with an empowered information where things which are beyond the field of vision radiate through the color, the ribbing, and, and signal them as themselves, uh, they can actually, um, is that working? It's the final slide. Um, 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 you can then kind of simulate the empowerment and, and make calibrated particular impositions and propositions for Google Campus, for instance, and then this prosperity engine uh, uh, will, 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 will deliver its next set of products, beautiful and wonderful and empowering products, uh, uh, months or years earlier uh, in, in a much more um, 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 uh, frequent kind of and, and empowering set of things which make all our lives uh, 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 much more worth living and we don't have to um, um, wait 20 years for another kind of mind-blowing uh, um, life enhancement. Thank you. Thank you.